call the meeting to order at 5.40. Um, thanks for your patience. Sorry, Jerome, for the uh, space being occupied. Um, are there any revisions to the agenda? Are there any public comments and correspondence? Any executive committee comments? Is there a motion to approve the minutes of October 17th and November 6th? I'll move that. Second. Is there any discussion on the draft articles? What's that? Three minutes. Oh, articles. Yeah. The draft articles. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the other discussion. No, we don't need pause in order to shift mental gears. Yeah, sorry. The draft minutes. Any discussion on the draft minutes? in favor of approving the minutes of October 17th and November 6th, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. So, uh, the first discussion item is the uh, budget draft, which is on page 7. So, this hasn't changed the draft you have in front of you. Um, of the budget that was in the packet has not changed since the last time you have seen it. What has changed is the assessments. And um, I want to give a real big note that's on the bottom before we even start to talk about this. We do not have equalized pupils from the Agency of Education. Mm -hmm. Things are behind. So these are the best estimates that can come out of this office. Uh, we know what we submitted from here, but we don't know what other schools are submitting. Um, you may have heard of the statewide longitudinal data system is coming up on up to speed and there are many schools that are very behind in submitting and what as you know equalized pupils gets adjusted based on the whole state's population um, it was actually a we had some funny back and forth between Lori myself and Michelle and I said let's just give them the best estimate we have and Michelle and and uh, Laura is usually so on the game that their best estimate's probably within two or three percent error. Um, so we wanted to, I really wanted to point out that note for you on the assessment piece. Um, and to have you ask any questions of what you see, uh, Laura's gonna give you kind of what the changes were due to changes in student population. I know you have that, Lori. Mm -hmm. um, so some of these assessments have increase and decrease due to what you see at the bottom there and the change in student population. Um, overall, we're down a few students in the SU unequalized people. So uh, so a no change like U32 actually means an increase because the overall relative percentage increases because uh, we're down a few students across the SU. So I don't know, Laura, do you want to go through that kind of mm -hmm. what's happened because a student, just the change in students has changed the assessments. Right. Thanks. So if you look at the bottom where it says change, you'll see um, <coughs> from our current projected equalized pupils, Berlin is projected to be down six, which means the assessment change that you're seeing would be less than the draft you had in the packet because if you have less equalized pupils, it means the assessment would go down. Okay. Same thing for Callis, East Montpelier, and you've already done your happy dance, Stephen, that it would be increasing. And so you pay a, a higher percentage of the um, WCSU budget, but there will be additional revenues projected when we calculate tax rates. Um, and then Middlesex, you also went down, and you see that we're actually projecting your assessments would be less than the current year budget. And Mr. Zup, same happy dance Stephen had. Um, and for U32, your share went yeah from 49.8% to 50.3% of the SU. And then your assessment change gets spread out amongst the towns based on their equalized pupils. So, just the, yeah. The total is the same. Total's the 174, the same. 284 is the same total. It's just a matter of redistributing. And probably another... Um, note is just that because we're doing the equalized pupils, the special ed isn't spiking, going up and down by school district based on individual students like it had been in the past. 
So okay. this has been a nice buffer for people. So this is what you've seen on paper. I wanted to go over that first. The majority, I should have said, again, the majority of this budget presentation is to answer the question around what can we do to increase for math. But we wanted to just, really nothing's really shifted in the budget that you have presented to you tonight besides the assessments because we did our best estimates of equalized peoples. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to kind of go through that first. We're thinking the majority of this presentation of what we're going to talk about tonight is what more can we do to help increase student performance in math, which was, I think, Carter was the one who asked that last time. Are there any clarifying questions or comments about what you see here for if we were to stay in an assessment? Is our student population down um, due to mergers around this? Nope. No? Okay. Nope. Our student population is down because we're down in student, we're losing student population within our tenants. Our tuitions, our tuitions are actually up higher than we estimated for this year, for U32. That, that seems like trend to me, 12, 12 more students out of the SU. We are, well, what do you mean, from the number? It seems like we, every year we're losing. We're losing well, we change every year. The, the, those numbers actually don't add up, so I'm, I'm assuming it's based on this is how many the changes from last year in terms of equalized students. Equalized people, body students. True. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bodies really. Bodies don't equate into the directly equate into budgetary equalized pupils are what we have to go by for every year. So um, we're down in equalized pupils and we're down in enrollments. Some places are up a little, some are down, but overall we're down for the issue. And just a comment you mentioned, I'm sure everyone's aware, but special education is <coughs> close to 50% of the SU budget. It's more than that. More. It's, it's almost 62%. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Who's that? That's for the services provided. Yeah. And how is it as a percentage overall? Not just the SU budget, but all the. You know, I don't have that. The entire issues. I don't, I don't have that with me. Okay. And you mean SU like the administrative budget? Of this, this budget, budget that we're looking at. Yeah. And I give you that as a rough 62% because I just think of it as five eighths when I look at the overall expenditure. About five million to special education, it's eight million overall. Are there any other questions about the assessment summary? If, you're, if we're ready, we'll move over to the question about Please. the math question. That's why I asked Jen to be here tonight um, to really help support and, and present that. Um, you know, we at the November sixth meeting, you asked how what because we saw the percentage that we were at. We we're at the one point nine six percent. You asked what more could we do to support student achievement to increase in math, and so. I wanted, before we get into that, I, I thought I asked Jen to kind of, if she could review with everybody what we're currently doing to improve <coughs> math performance. And a lot of it's through professional development, but Jen, maybe you could yeah, give us a kind so, of update what the current state is. With, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of information sort of historically since I've been here, and then that'll lead into what we've been doing. You may or may not know that we hosted a math lab school in 2013 and 2014 many, many, many of our teachers who teach mathematics participated, as did all of our administrators, um, so much so that our administrators worked with directly with students as well. Um, the second time we hosted it, I got that opportunity too. I had my hosting responsibilities enough under my belt that I got to work directly with a student as well, which was amazing. Um, the math lab school 
is um, is still happening in some way, shape, or form. This past summer, it it didn't happen in the way that it has historically. Um, due to enrollment and a few other things, but we have partnered with other uh, supervisor mm -hmm. unions who are approaching mathematics in many of the same ways. And so we've moved the hosting responsibilities around, and we still have teachers or new administrators who attend that lab school. We engaged in a comprehensive and collaborative review of mathematics in 2013-14, much like the literacy audit many, many years ago, to um, hear both commendations and recommendations We've implemented a lot of those recommendations, um, and a number of them were about more professional development and math. You're going to hear more about that a little bit tonight, but the biggest piece, I think, that came from that work was um, the idea of hiring a coach to help us with mathematics. So we did hire a coach in 14-15. Um, that FTE, the, the full-time equivalent, has varied a little bit over the years. We've been relying on Title IIA funds to support that position, and um, we've changed the the focus of that work and the structure of that work over the year to try to maximize the position. Um, this year, you know, I believe that um, that our one we have two math coaches now. We have one who is 0.8 FTE, and we have one who is 0.4 FTE. So we've really tried to hone in on more um, impact cycles with coaching and working at fewer schools rather than spreading one resource too thin. <clears throat> We've worked with a consultant and a neighboring supervisory union over the years as well to create benchmark assessments that are common assessments that we administer three times a year across the system that are aligned to our performance indicators for kids. Our math coaches routinely hire curriculum topic study or um, host curriculum topic studies or lesson studies in mathematics. So a few times a year, which are um, some intensive professional learning opportunities for our teachers to engage in. We, since, um, since we first started curriculum camp, math has been a stalwart in terms of participation. We've had more people participate in math than in any other content area. And the um, work has been pretty deep and pretty rich. We've done a lot of work on revising performance indicators as our teachers have gotten more knowledgeable about what the expectations are for kids. We've created um, scope and sequences in mathematics, and most recently we've been focusing on effective instructional practices in math at Curriculum Camp. And then another thing that we're doing right now is we're looking at math programs. So we've been engaged in a math pilot. What happened a number of years ago when the Common Core came on board is that the, the math programs that we had were no longer in alignment with our student learning expectations for kids. And so we were distancing ourselves from a program. We were really concentrating on um, bolstering the professional knowledge and skill of all of our instructors of mathematics. And, um, and when we asked experts in the fields, what do you think about a program? What do you recommend? They said, there is no program out there that is aligned enough to the common core that we think it would meet your needs. So we've sort of held off. And now, after all these investments, we are hearing from both our teachers of math and our principals that a, a program as a resource would be a really helpful tool for our teachers, knowing that their professional knowledge and their professional judgment really needs to come first. Um, but we are piloting a number of programs. We are only looking at programs that have met, that have met um, criteria on focus and coherence, rigor, and usability based on um, a, a source called Ed Reports. And of those, we're getting our teachers together, we're engaging in curriculum topic study, we're doing an analysis of the programs based on what we've identified as the most effective teaching practices in mathematics. Um, we've piloted one program at the elementary level, one at the middle school, and one at the high school level, and we're getting ready to take on a second and possibly a third program. We've done our research budgetarily so that um, we're, we would be prepared one way or another. Um, we've um, been thinking as we plan ahead to professional learning about what it would take in terms of any in-service time or other PD to adopt a program with fidelity. So that those are some of the inputs in recent years and most currently. 
I think one of the things you, you said it quickly, John, it's just because you live in this world, but you said Title IIA is funding our curriculum camp, and that's federal funds. And we, every year, aren't sure whether we're going to have. We are, the way, the nice thing about the timing of curriculum camp, and when we apply for federal funds, there's a year. So if we knew in a year, and one of the reasons I'm highlighting this for you, I'm going to give you some costs of some things. I'm going to give you some general areas. Um, and we'll talk about these different places and how strategies we might want to use budgetarily for things we may want. Lori, I forgot to bring in some chart paper that's on the, in my office on the norms chart. If you can just grab the whole piece. I'm sorry, I was running from one meeting to another. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. um, so before we start talking about um, any of these uh, ideas, we spent uh, six hours in this room as a leadership team uh, last Tuesday to really tackle this question. And the thing that isn't fair really for the whole system or I've learned through the whole system is that while the leadership team had a chance to talk, we didn't have a chance to engage our staff. So tonight I'm gonna to be as vague as possible and give you as enough specifics so you feel like you're there. But this is a discussion, and I was saying this last night at East Montpelier, is that it's hard to have this discussion without planning with the staff. And what I've learned over the years of uh, serving you as superintendent is it's not a get the board on board first or get the staff on board first, it's get everything together. The hard part about this budgetarily is you've got to make some budget decisions. So I want to really honor that the staff hasn't been in this conversation, the leadership team has been in this conversation. We, the staff's been in the conversation of everything Jen just talked to you about, but to look forward and project of additional resources, we're going to talk about four key areas. So I, I want to talk, and I asked Lori to go get some charts from that day so you could actually see, yeah, you got it. Bring it all right over here, because I have to go through it. There's one okay. key piece of paper I want off of there that I need It's really grab. a picture, so be careful. Well, <laughs> it's plastic, it's not going to work. Um, well, we spent the day, and if you just give me a minute, I'm just going to grab one key piece of paper that's in here. So we went through the day and we started using a protocol. We really took the question that you had sent for us. Math goal, increase it, in, to increase achievement as measured by STAR 360 from 45% proficient as measured this September to 71%, which is if you remember the teachers went out and, and we asked all the teachers, what, of the instructors of math, where do you think your kids can be in June? Um, proficient by June 2019 and ensure at least 90% of our students make at least one year of growth in math achievement as measured by STAR 360. So that's what we reported to you in the student monitoring. So the SUY goal, as I said, was created through teacher input. This fall, our teachers looked at their student performance in STAR 360 and set classroom goals accordingly. Then our principals created school goals based on their teachers' goals and finally, we compiled one as the SU that gets to that 71%. You asked us on the six, what resources do the schools need in the next year to improve student performance in math? So to that end, the leadership team took up this question at their meeting on November 13th. We prepared tonight to share with you the process we went through. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the process and then with what our conclusions are. After that meeting, we shared a collaborative document that we started to really try to write this out because we couldn't get that all done in that meeting. And Jen and, Jen and I were the leaders of that, mainly Jen, um, and putting this document together to come around four central themes that came out of that day. We started with a protocol called a futures protocol, which is really a strategic planning protocol that says, take a time and period ahead in time. So we took three years, although the, our current implementation plan, we're in a third year of a five year implementation plan. And we said, what do we want it to look like around here for instruction 
three years from now. So all these pieces of paper that I, you just saw the packet come in are brainstormed of what's it going to look like in the future. And we got outside of math pretty quickly. And Jen, interject here if I forget something. Okay. I think there's something important. Um, and I'm going to, I should have said at the beginning, I'm going to set the context and then Jen's going to talk about each of the separate pieces we came to. We spent the morning really saying, these are all the different things we need to do. The lists got really long. And so after lunch, we kind of reset and said, hey, we were asked about math. What specifically in math? And one of our colleagues, who's really good at protocol, she said, we're using the wrong protocol right now. She said, we need to stop and we need to use what we call the five whys protocol. That you say, you're asked a question and you say, why, five times. Why is that happening? and you try to get down to what you think the root cause might be. And so I'm gonna show you that piece of paper. And I think it's really powerful because one of the things you're gonna see in one of these four, I, I don't think you, you're gonna to expect to hear from us. So we said, mass scores are low. There's a lack of opportunity. To, why, mass scores are low, why? The first why was there's a lack of opportunity to reteach in a timely manner based on formative assessments. Why is that? Students don't have skills identified in math at each grade level. Well, why is that? We start, the schedule doesn't give it to us, give us time to do it. We don't have the materials. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the FTEs, number of teachers we need. Community beliefs, this came out really strong. We all, I think it was about 30 seconds, we said, that's the thing. Our community doesn't believe in math. So why is that? Why is that? People lack the importance given to external data and actively resist against, the culture actively resists against data and math and quantitative number crunching. We're seeing that. So there's no urgency. We said there's a lack of accountability and places you could do, so where is job, you know, where is math used? I mean, what do you use it for in your job? Do people see the importance of math and that it's not just a calculation. We really came down to is, it's the perception about math of what is it that, um, that math's not just a calculation, it's a way of thinking, it's a problem solving, there's beauty in math, and that perception that we have, we have the U.S. culture thing, but it's also something that's very strong in our communities. So our number one thing that we came up with was we need to really get a community engagement going about why math's important to learn. And we need help doing that. We really need to build this strong. The second thing we came up with was professional growth to support high quality math instruction. Jen just talked to you about a lot, but we're going to talk. She's going to talk about the details of each of those. There are structural slash organizational changes to the system. Specifically, we need more time for instruction and more professional collaboration within a school and amongst our teachers across schools. And we need to meet our students' emotional, social, and emotional needs. When Jen and I were putting this together, we came up with, is it four parts, Jen? You're looking at right there, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, four parts, how we broke down each of those. I want Jen to talk to the, each of these. And Did you say sorry, just more time for social and emotional needs? Meeting that? students' social and emotional needs. Meeting students. Okay. Social and emotional needs. Is that particular on the or just general? Overall. Just general. This is what was hard for us, and we spent the morning look, we got out of math really fast, and that's why we had to refocus in the afternoon, and we got to these whys, and then it's really started to focus us on math. But it was, it was really interesting how quickly we got to that cultural belief mm -hmm. of where we are with math instruction. That, and that was pretty, was, I think it was pretty unanimous that we were all there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we didn't know it was there. It was pretty phenomenal. It's one of the nice things about those five whys it asked you to... To get deeper into what's causing it. So, we wanted to give you a little bit more um, information about what we're thinking about more specifically for each of these themes. And 
When we think about community engagement, about the importance of mathematics, we're really talking about wanting to um, increase the knowledge of math and an appreciation for math in the community, um, and to increase support for math education in general. So we're talking about um, almost a PR campaign, right? Like I went to um, see the Sunday matinee at Little, of Little Shop of Horrors, and the auditorium was absolutely packed. We want it to be absolutely packed for some like math extravaganza, right? <laughs> Same kind of thing. So um, we're talking about, I mean, some of what Bill mentioned is that um, societally, not just unique to our community, it is perfectly fine to say, I don't like math, I'm not good at math, I don't do math. It's not societally okay to say that about other um, subject areas. We also know that there are studies that will link um, sort of achievement in mathematics with your overall earning potential as an individual. We know that when we're thinking about our transferable skills and the problems that we're facing in the world, that STEM education is fundamentally important and math is absolutely a huge component there. So I think the rationale is clear. We're thinking about um, how, ways that we can engage the community in, um, in deepening their appreciation of math, ways that we can be more intentional in celebrating mathematics, in educating families about the teaching of mathematics, about um, conceptual understanding as well as procedural problem solving. Um, we want to do more education with you as board members too, so that you're understanding what's going on in the world of math education, what are those effective practices, what do we need to, to do to implement them. And in terms of your role most immediately, we're hoping that you are willing to take a stand about the importance of mathematics, that when we talk about community engagement and the goal that you have realized as a board, um, or articulated as a board about community engagement, that part of your actions will be um, focused on mathematics as well. Um, and be willing to make some hard choices when it comes down to what, what is most important for our students. Um, because there will be hard choices because there are finite resources, which I'm going to segue to the next one then. Um, we're talking about building our professional um, growth to increasing the knowledge and skill of our teachers of mathematics. And, you know, when I think one of the things that Bill may not Can have said... Hmm? Can I interrupt for a minute? The term teachers of mathematics, what mm -hmm. does that mean? Anybody who teaches yeah. math. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But not any teacher. But not, not necessarily, <clears throat> right? So um, not necessarily a, a Spanish teacher. Um, so the other thing I want to say is that we ground, we spent some time in the morning before we delved into those protocols, um, grounding ourselves in some of the research, some of the meta-analyses that Hattie has done, that Marzano has done. We looked back at the DMG report and some of Nate Levinson's work, um, just so that we could have some, some of that common conversation and grounding before we delved into the futures protocol and the five whys. And, um, and there are recommendations in um, some of those reports that we really want to explore more thoroughly around, again, the importance <coughs> of knowing that anybody who is teaching math really needs to know the math at least you know, two or three years below them and two or three years above them in order to understand and meet students' needs developmentally in mathematics, um, to make sure that our students who um, have the greatest difficulty in mathematics are taught by the teachers who know math the best. That is not happening universally in the system yet. Um, and to really capitalize on, um, on building those job embedded structures. Um, we, our, our coaching has been a step in the right direction, but you know, a, a 0.8 math teacher, even a one point, or math coach, even a 1.2 in this area is spreading our resource um, pretty thin. So the board's role, I think, is um, again supporting us with resources um, and supporting the concept that students who have the greatest need are taught by the teachers who have the greatest knowledge and skill in the content areas that, that they're serving. And what would you say the, um, since we're in the math class in 2013, 2014, mm -hmm. math school labs, mm -hmm. or math lab school? What has been the improvement or development of 
mathematics in, in our teachers since then through today? Yeah, I think that um, if I were to summarize the greatest <clears throat> shift, I think it would be that the math lab school helped us deepen our conceptual knowledge as math teachers so that then we could understand the, the, um, the student levels of knowing around sort of having some intuition around math, needing to use some concrete materials, then representing, then thinking about math more abstractly and procedurally, and then thinking about applying and transferring their knowledge. But, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll throw my, myself up there. I learned math very procedurally, but I never, I didn't, I didn't learn it conceptually. I didn't really have a thorough understanding of additive reasoning or multiplicative reasoning and how what I was learning as a third and fourth grader with multiplication would serve me when I was learning algebra. I didn't learn that at all. I've learned it now as a curriculum director guiding teachers, right? Um, and so that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to do so that we're really intentional in terms of our learning targets and our, our levels of knowing and scope and sequence for our students. Has what's been done so far had any um, measurable improvement in math abilities of our students? You know, I think anecdotally, but you've seen the scores, Chris, yeah, and you know, they're guess. pretty, they're 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 flat, flat and right. they're low. They should be. We should see growth and we should see higher school scores for for as well resourced a community as we are. We would expect more. And um, I'm grateful for you all for asking this question because I, we've rattled off the inputs and we haven't seen the changes we would expect to see. So, right. posing the question, being monitored more carefully engaging in cycles of action research, that's what we need to be doing. We owe it to our kids. And um, and so, I mean, some of these are tough questions and tough conversations, but I'm thrilled that we're having them. Yeah, no, it's yeah. No, just informational. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, the third theme is really about the structures and the systems to, um, to support all of our students and specifically more time for instruction and for professional collaboration. Um, I, I think if you've heard me ever talk about proficiency-based learning, you've heard me say that in a proficiency-based learning system, achievement is the constant and time should be a variable. And that's true. All of our students need to achieve proficiency in these rigorous standards, but right now we're still really time-based. So we need to be thinking about how do we create a structure that's more flexible around time so that students who need more time have more time. And just as importantly, we know that all of our students should be engaged in high quality first instruction, what we call tier one instruction in a multi-tiered system of support and that any additional supports that they need, um, be it you know, intervention or um, IEP supports, should be in addition to. And we are not set up right now in a way that allows for that to happen for all of our students, um, especially students who have needs in both literacy and mathematics. And why are we not set up that way? In this because, I mean, in part, there's not enough time in the day, in part because, um, this goes back to some of the community engagement questions, we um, aren't, we're, we're making hard choices or we're not making hard choices around, you know, uh, I mean, even, let me, let me give you a super concrete example. Um, if a student in elementary school needs additional supports in literacy, and additional supports in math, that w and we want them in 90 minutes of instruction for lit, and we want them in at least 60 minutes for mathematics. Um, then there's also there's morning meeting, there's art, there's music, there's PE. Like what are what are they? Can I just add another yeah. thing? I will say this for me, mm -hmm. I have felt the community pressure to make sure we have all the extras before we have sufficient time for core instruction. I'm not saying that I shouldn't have felt it, that, that's what I've perceived. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm willing to ask the hard question to the board, as you've heard me ask, Chris, yeah. what are your priorities? You know, it's just, it's a question we were asked right at the Rumney board meeting last time. You know, and it's a, you gave a beautiful response about when someone said, well, wouldn't you want to be everything for the whole child? And the answer is yes, we'd all want to answer yes to that. But sometimes there's some priorities 
And are we willing to, you know, that's the question that we have for the boards of, are we willing to say there's some things, whether we want to use guarantee or something else that we don't have 60 minutes of instruction for math for every kid in the system. It's not happening today, every day. Well, just, when you, um, if there's 60 minutes allocated, and you said that there's not 60 minutes for every kid, is that because it's not being allocated or just? Both. Yeah. Yeah. There, we have some schools that don't have it allocated every day. They have 60 minutes of, U32 does not have 60 minutes of math instruction every day. I think, um, I think another thing, and again, this goes to some community engagement is, um, well, first of all, let me back up. I want to acknowledge that these are hard conversations. These are conversations about our values for kids and, um, and hard choices. So engaging people in a really um, authentic and honest way is going to be really important, right? I think the other thing is um, sometimes we are taking the short view instead of the long view. And when we can think about um, a kid's experience in our system from pre-K through graduation, we know that it's really true that if a, if a student is needs intervention right now when they're entering middle school, right now the interventions are set up as, as classes like reading strategies and math strategies that kids are taking and they need to be taking them, but it, it limits their choices even more drastically than choices may have been limited in the elementary school. And so um, by considering what is most important in our elementary schools or, make, or prioritizing, then we ultimately, and addressing them, then we ultimately open up more choices for kids as they get to middle and high school. But I want to, I mean, these, these are not easy conversations to have. Like, it makes me nervous to just put it in the room, quite honestly, because I know, I mean, I know people have very different values. Um, so again, it's all, these are four themes, but they're all interrelated. We're going to have to make that decision as a, as a group here. Um, and then... So I think that's probably enough on that one. And then the final thing is that you know that we've been thinking a lot about um, meeting our kids' needs, not just academically, but socially and emotionally. Many of our students are coming to us with greater needs than they have in the past. We're doing a lot of learning about um, how to meet their needs socially and emotionally so that they can access learning. And so. We just want to make sure not only that we have the professional knowledge that we need among our staff members so that we can meet needs, but that we also have adequate staffing to meet their needs. Um, we want to articulate or at least explore the possibility of a social emotional learning curriculum for students. And that again, all of that would take some support on your end as board members, um, both in terms in resor of resources and priorities. But we know from our work already with Dave Melnick that, um, and others that, that if a student is, a mot is not available for learning, we can, we can have the best academic interventions in the world and it's not going to make a huge impact on them. So um, again, I just want to underscore what we're sharing is um, at this point is sort of those, the broadest of brush strokes. The things that we've engaged in, we've engaged in these conversations over the years with uh, certainly with educators and with you in, in some way, shape or form, but to put it all together and focus it well, to answer the question that you've asked, um, we just wanna say these are, these are the themes, but it really takes many more people and many more conversations. Yeah, sorry, I had a, sorry, I had a question. I, Go ahead. I heard Bill when he said that he was going to be vague, but I, I'm wondering if there's, even in broad strokes, anything specific you could say about what a socio-emotional uh, learning curriculum would look like or continue Yeah, I mean, so I'll, I'll tell you one thing for sure that we did was this summer, we, um, we had, through our transferable skills, we, at curriculum camp, we had a group of, um, of teachers, administrators, and school counselors get together and look at our transferable skills and start to revise them to ensure that we are really honing in on some social-emotional learning. Um, but it's, there's a, um, there are all sorts of strategies that we could more um, intentionally, I guess, implement around um, emotions, feelings, self-regulation, mindfulness, 
empathy, those sorts of things that we would want to look at a little more systematically than we have. And there's been some talk about also a way of, I don't even want to use the word assessment because I think that's too strong, but a way of understanding where students are at through their developmental progression from pre-K to graduation and mm -hmm. social emotional oh. learning. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that's been a conversation that's just started in the past what month, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one of our counselors brought that to us and said, hey, we should be thinking about how we're tracking social and emotional growth for kids so we know where they're going. I, other questions for Jen, because I want to sum this up and I want folks to have. So is the social emotional uh, curriculum a broad based all students or? Well, we would, I think we would approach kids meeting social, kids' social and emotional learning needs the same way we approach them academically, that mm -hmm. there's sort of a universal approach or curriculum that's gonna meet the vast majority of our students' needs. And then some students may need a little bit more. We're already doing some of this stuff around um, PBIS or positive behavior interventions and supports. There's a tier two, like some kids, um, in order to, to regulate and get positive feedback, need a, a more formal check-in, check-out system, for example, than, than many students. And we have some of those supports in place. And then there's some kids who have even more um, individualized or significant needs who may need more support than that. Um, so, so that we would approach it very similarly. And when you read the literature and the research around um, what broadly in the nation is response to intervention, not multi-tiered system of supports or MTSS, but RTI, um, they talk about that too. Just the idea of academics and, and behavior, social, emotional stuff coming together to support kids. So, I, I appreciate the importance of the social-emotional, yeah. and I know it's increasing and yeah. becoming more difficult. However, and I can only draw on East Montpelier, mm -hmm. our literacy is trending up, our math is trending down. Mm -hmm. It's the same kids. Mm -hmm. So I find it hard to hard to accept social emotional is causing the math problem. That's not what we're saying. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's not. Okay, but so then I'm trying to bring us back to this is about math and the budget and resources in my mind. Yeah. And I, I don't want to get drawn so far afield of that. And I, you know, I can get focused. So this has been very informative, but I want to get back to math, and are we going to allocate resources for math, or what are we going to do to improve our math? That's what I want to know. And to me, social, emotional isn't going to improve our math. Well, no, it will. It will improve everything. It's not just quite as direct. Yeah. Yeah. But it's pretty important. I, I understand. <laughs> but... I mean, from a harsh perspective, so I bring my military background, you don't reinforce a failure. To me, math's been a failure. We've tried some things, we've allocated resources, we've done some things, none of it's working. We've tried some things, we've allocated some resources and literacy, and we're seeing results, it's working. Um, so, so I'm hesitant to allocate more resources to something that's not working. I and is it more fundamental? So I wouldn't say that because it is more fundamental. Uh, uh, as we quickly went over the professional development needs and specialization of uh, the amount of knowledge an elementary teacher has in literacy compared to their knowledge in math is a huge gap. Mm -hmm. To come out with an elementary education endorsement, you need one course in math that's either pedagogical or content. You can have your last content course can be Algebra 2 your junior year in high school. While in literacy, you have a lot more expertise. And so we haven't been willing to make the shift, and I include myself in this, to saying we're going to put our best math teachers and be, have them be the instructors in math. That's talking about specialization right. in, in okay. elementary schools. Saying we're going to, because you need a master's degree to be an effective teacher in any content area. 
and you really do. And we have a lot of elementary teachers that have a lot of expertise in literacy. We're not there in math. And do we have enough teachers right now that would even fit the need? If, if, you, if the criteria is messed to be There aren't enough teachers in, in Vermont to go hire if we had to hire more to do it, Chris. We have to build our own. Okay. That's the message I would give you. And we have the right people. I think there's people here to do that. But it's you've got to you you've got to build from within the hiring climate and what there is. I mean, if you want to hire a math teacher, especially at the middle school or secondary level, you better get it done by April first because they're not there anymore. So um, you've got to you've got to get folks that have that type of content and pedagogical knowledge. And usually, a lot of the ones who do come out of pre service. If they do, they have the content knowledge, but not the pedagogical. Would you agree with me on that, Jen? Yeah, I mean, it's generally one or the other. It's, it's generally not both. So content, but not method? Is yeah. You mean by pedagogical yeah. method? Yeah. 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 yeah, like I know how to do the math, but I don't necessarily know how to teach it. Teach it. But that's what, so that's what my bias is yeah. Yeah. to math specialists in elementary school. Um, but the re so, Let's do an if. We'll go, not the wise, we'll go to the three years future. Um, but um, the reality might be we're allocating enough resources for math coaches. The problem is we've got too many teachers that we're trying to elevate their performance in math. Mm -hmm. So if there were, and I don't know if six, well, I don't know if five, one in each elementary school is the number, but if it's one in el each elementary school, so it's five teachers, then 1.2 FTEs of math coaches might be enough for five teachers. Mm -hmm. And if we want enough math coaches for all the elementary school teachers, does it make any difference if there's one, two, or three? Probably what we need is a dozen. So we're never gonna get there for allocating math coaches at the elementary school level. So I'm, I was waiting to hear what you had to say structurally. I was wondering if there was gonna be some, I, I, I agree that I, I think, I, I think structurally, and I don't know if a math specialist is here, but I think structurally we need to do something. and. My, so my limited experience is I would be in agreement that all students, particularly at the elementary school, do not receive the same quality of math experience. Mm -hmm. It varies greatly from teacher to teacher. Mm -hmm. Some are very good, some are very poor. And it's a crapshoot on who you get as an elementary school teacher on how well you prepared math was. So, can we steal a structural question? Yeah, I mean, again, some of these conversations are ones that we've flirted with over the years, but haven't had recently around. Um, do are we looking at specialization in elementary schools? Does that mean classroom teachers? Does that mean special educators? Does that I mean, do we have enough alloc uh, resources allocated to math interventionists at all of our elementary schools? In some elementary schools, we do have designated interventionists and others. We don't, or we have like a fraction of what we might need. Um, the, the schedule one is one too, right? Like when you actually try to build a schedule, it's almost impossible right now to do everything without sacrificing something, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't even mention, I don't think, science and social studies at the elementary level, which, I mean, um, has a lot of room for improvement as well. Strictly from a time allocation point, quite frankly, um, let alone looking at inquiry-based approaches to science and, and global citizenship. So um, these, are the, these are the conversations, Stephen, that are hard ones, I think, to, to have. And they're ones that we've... Um, in this particular context, not taking that the questions back to the people who would be most impacted. Well, most and I appreciate that this was more of an overview yeah. thing, but <clears throat> so from a board member, and I try to be very clear. Yeah. Um, 
if if there's an expectation for additional resources, yeah. then I don't want it put in the same place because I'm not seeing res as a as a board member. I don't. I'm not seeing our investments panning out from a strictly business point of view. Can I just ask Stephen? Right? What you're saying is you you don't want it. Are you talking specifically about coaching? Is that what you're talking about, or, or I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how are we going to improve math? Right. And I'm hesitant to spend more money at allocating more resources for things that we've been currently doing that haven't yielded any results. So oh. it sounds like you're looking for a business plan of saying if, if we put in this much money, how would it be yeah. used and what would be the expectation? And I'm saying I cannot give Sorry. you that business plan in two weeks okay. because of the culture and the way expectations are to work in Washington Central. We, you, I've learned and learned through experience that if we don't bring the staff at the same time we bring the boards, mm -hmm. if one is before the other, someone doesn't get the full story and then the learning doesn't happen at the same time, then it, it usually causes a lot more, um, I think, cleanup not clean up, uh, I'm trying to figure the right word here. It, it causes a lot more angst. And so to come back to you as a board in two, two to three weeks to say, here's the full, Jen and I could have gone and done a plan and brought it back to you. Or the leadership team could have gone and done a plan and brought it back to you with a full business plan, looking at all that, but we haven't done it with the staff. So there's gonna be staff that are passionate about some other, they're gonna say, why did you pick math? And, and I'm passionate about my area I teach. We could take take whatever the SLOs you want that we haven't talked about between literacy and math, any of those others, you would hear there would be, and that needs to be understood. That's back to our marketing piece about our community values. We I hear very loudly in Washington Central that the arts are very highly valued. So <clears throat> I'm sure we would hear from folks that value that. Not good, bad, and different, just we would hear from it. And so I think it's about, it's about bringing everyone together. So to say that there's a dollar figure, I mean, I've run numbers, some back of the envelope numbers to say, here's the type of cost for different types of professional development. The structural things, I agree, I believe we need to do some structural things, but I'm not willing to go out there and do it because what I learned from Romney this past year was it's even though and it works in, it may work in one other school to do a schedule the way it's been done, that if it's not done the right way, it causes a lot of time to do a lot of explanation. So we've got to put in the front end time to do this. Yeah. And so that's the way I've learned about our five towns in Washington Central. And so I'm not willing to go out with much more specifics. And if you're not comfortable with the board, that's fine. We'll keep working. We'll keep shifting things when we need to. Um, and come to you if we need extra resources, but I'm not going to come to you with a full-fledged plan unless the staff and the boards are doing that. Not necessarily together in the same room, but in parallel tracks and talking about what we're trying to do. That's been my learning. Um, I have a question. Um, so are we looking for options? For instance, I'm hearing that we need more time that our teachers uh, need to be more proficient in teaching math. Those are the two big things I'm hearing. So my first question is, what are the carrots we put out there to get all these teachers who are probably not a lot interested in math um, to choose that as a focus to improve themselves. Now, I don't know anything about how the contract works or how the assessment works when I know the teachers meet with their mm -hmm. principal or whoever and they talk about what needs to be done. But um, I guess kind of goes along with uh, community involvement is how do we get the community to say to the schools and the teachers, we want you to focus on math and get the teachers focusing on math too. 
it, to me, that sounds like a, a lot of work, but I think that's where we need to find a path to get it done. Um, we, um, is, is the most pressing thing time for like more so, hours in the day? So I've done some numbers. If you want to add 30 minutes to the schedule based on the current contract, it's a million dollars. Is 30, is 30 minutes sufficient? No, it's not. Neither is 180 days in the, in the school year. You know, I mean, if we're, we are competing internationally. Mm -hmm. the, the, our kids, our kid, my daughter, who's a sophomore in high school, is not competing with Vermont kids for a job when she gets done with a job. She's competing with kids around the nation, around the world. She's competing against kids that have 200, 220 days of school for eight hours a day and have a thinner curriculum than we do in the U.S. So, I mean, jobs are being outsourced every day. Engineer, engineering jobs are the things that are flying out of this nation right now. Not the, not the telecommunication and network support type stuff, but people who are designing. And I mean, China has more English language speakers than we do in the U.S. So, you know, we're competing against their best, and our kids are gonna compete against their best, and they have to be really flexible and really creative thinkers. That's what puts the U.S. in the place where our kids can compete is when they're in the creative thinking pieces. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to say the kids, this is back to math being a thinking, it's a way of thinking. Most of us who have succeeded in math have done so under, just as Jen said about herself, a procedural math. You know how to do math. You may not know why it works. You know, I'm one of the people that's a conceptual math person. I always have been, it's been a strength of mine, is I can see the numbers and see how they, in my head, I can see how they relate to each other and see those relationships. I'm on the rare side of that, just because that's kind of how I was, I was a son of a math teacher who taught me that way. I would have been the procedural learner. I was lucky to have one of those. But we want all kids to have that access. And so we have to have teachers that can teach conceptually, which is a very different type of teaching than a procedural. You know, you can all think of how maybe you were taught to divide fractions, and there's not a rhyme that I can ever remember about invert and multiply instead of, and never ask why. Um, but yeah, Mahesh does. It. I've heard many people say it, and I just can't remember the rhyme. Like, but why do you invert and multiply for, you know, but you have to understand what's going on. The, that's the point of really understanding math because our memories can only hold, hold so much information. As a form, the few times I taught high school math, the kids that didn't understand fractions were tripping up when I was teaching pre-calc and calculus. And they didn't see it, and we, lost, <coughs> we lose a lot of kids around that time in the math program here. We don't have many kids going for that upper level. Um, we have to get, we need that, that piece. And so I can give you other figures of other things you know about, about, but I can't give you a plan. And that's why I want to respond to Steve. Any card one? Oh, well, I, I think I was going to summarize that point, which is a couple weeks ago we asked for a recommendation for next year's budget to improve math. And what, you're, what I'm hearing you telling us is it's a much bigger strategic conversation that you're not ready to make a recommendation. I'm not ready to come and say, I need X amount of dollars tomorrow and I know exactly how to spend it. I can tell you that, I can tell you if you gave us this amount of money, I can, I can give you some target areas, but we have to develop to get everyone on the bus. And there's certain areas we think we can get to by June, but not, not a full-fledged strategy. And I think the strategies that we're doing are gonna pay off. I actually disagree with Stephen that if you think you're gonna get change in three years in instructional technique, you're not. It's a five to seven year piece, and we've been working on that. But we've got the, stru the structural operational things are the things we need to do next. And as your superintendent, I need to know that all the boards have the back of us when we make some of those changes. And if, if we have to do it in certain ways, I'd rather know up front because it's, we're gonna, I look for a tipping point and not for consensus. I look for seven, when 75% of the people aren't on the bus, we go. We don't wait for 100%. Because if we wait for 100%, we're not going to affect change. 
Exactly. In terms of when, but when you expect to see some, at least in the um, earlier grades, some different math uh, achievement because you know if the, if the so be so Jen, of, Jen, have all our have all our math teachers in the elementary grade taken that math lab school? Not every single. Yeah, no, no, not, not, not every oh, single one. It's by choice. Men. It's can't mandate it. What school? The, the math lab school. Okay. okay. Oh, it's by choice. It's by oh, choice. Yeah, yeah. So if, if, if we're going to go through specialization and like have one math teacher for the entire elementary school. No, that's not what we're saying. But oh, oh, we're saying, it's, I mean, that's, we don't, we haven't, we haven't planned it out. I mean, this is the other thing is, I can't say exactly how we do the specialization. Some some places have done it by some of our schools have already chosen to, to do it. So for example, there's a there might be a team of teachers that teach third and fourth grade and one teacher teaches math to third graders and math to fourth graders and the other teacher is the literacy teacher for those third graders and those fourth graders. Mm -hmm. That, that is happening in some of our schools. It's not happening in all of our schools. And there are all sorts of reasons why in some places it happens and in some places it doesn't, right? Some of it is philosophical and centered around the whole child. Some of it is really just pragmatic and numbers. Um, some configurations change year after year based on the numbers. We've experienced that at Romney over the years. We're certainly experiencing that at East Montpelier right Dallas. now. But even Berlin has done it, right? Like, it, yeah, Callis right now. I mean, some of it's a just a response to, to numbers and class size um, and how best to meet kids' needs. So, so it's happening in different ways in different schools for different reasons, all of which are legitimate. Um, so, or most of which are legitimate. <laughs> sorry. I just want to try to, I don't know, figure out how we uh, move forward in this conversation. Um, and I've, I've just been kind of letting the conversation go because I'd, I'd like to, I'd talk about this all night if I was given the and choice. Maybe we should. I mean, just, just because of it's that fundamental. Well, um, what I, addition. there's a couple things. I'm not all night. What, what <laughs> a couple things I want to ask. One is, uh, you know, again, we are a committee. We're not the sort of SU board. Right. Um, and this seems like a conversation that, um, you know, it's well worth bringing to the SU board so that everyone is hearing this and everyone is kind of, uh, you know, engaged in the conversation. So that's just one observation I would make. Um, and the, the, the second question, the thing or question, I guess, is I take the point that, you know, there's not really much, um, there's not really much logic to kind of making a piecemeal decision about some minor budget allocation, you know, at this specific point in time, and that there are a lot of issues to wrestle with. Um, I think there's not a, there's, there's nothing that you have put on the table tonight that in my mind is out of bounds or shouldn't be considered or, or there shouldn't be some plan around how to shift or change or drive or advance them. Um, so I guess the question, and I, I feel like this is, it's dovetailing in a way with our, with our conversation about um, goals for educational outcomes. Um, the School Quality Committee was talking, for example, about asking the leadership team, administration, about what, what would a three-year you know, goal look like? Um, and maybe there's a larger question, um, you know, or sort of maybe, maybe it's what does a five-year strategic plan look like to dramatically improve uh, student learning outcomes, um, and, and I mean dramatically improve them, like ambitious, you know, to, to do that. Um, and I guess so. There's 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 two things. I, I am I am personally I don't know if this is the sentiment of the committee or of the SU board as a whole. I'm personally extremely interested in hearing that plan. Um, I am wondering, uh, you know given everything, I mean, there's nothing more important than, than this, I guess, so I was going to say, given everything that's on the people's, people's uh, tape, you know, plates, like, what's a reasonable um, sort of timeline or, or process? So, I, I want to respond to that, Matthew. Okay. I feel a bit of a trap from that question. Okay. Because I, I finally see the board, for the first time this year, really take an interest in data. We don't see that in our staff yet. They're growing. Different places are at different levels. I don't see that in the community. 
So our, this is why I ask you, where are you going to stand as a board? And where are all the boards going to stand in taking and being bold? Because when we come out with that plan, if we don't do it collaboratively, like I said, we could do that as a leadership team. But without having done that with the staff and with the boards at the same time, we're putting ourselves out there. And my experience has been with the boards in Washington Central, when a, one or two people complain about an issue or bring question about an issue, there's usually the boards pulling back from where they might have been. And so I'm asking, where do you stand governance-wise? If you want to task us with doing that, we can. I'm saying I want to do it with the staff, and I want some time to do that. But I also need to know that we have, and you have right to hear about what the plan is and to give us feedback about the plan. But there's got to be a place where it said, you know, there's a level, and I want to know where the level is, where the administration and the staff have right to say, we're going to change this. And we're going to do it, and we're going to stay with it for a while. And that's the structure. That's the structure's an organizational piece. Do, do you understand why? I'm, do folks understand why I'm saying this? Back to you, the question that you're asking. Yeah, I think that what I'm trying to wrestle with, I guess, then is um, it's sort of this endless cart horse, cart horse thing. Like you know, what I guess I would, the question would be, what what do you want the boards to? To commit to, um, you know, is it uh, any change at, no. at, of anything, like you know, in these for, areas or in for, any first, area? Like, first, I don't even know if the boards, if the boards really feel math is, if there's a prioritization in the SLOs. That's what I want to know first. I've been asking that question. I I haven't seen a direct response. I've seen some conversation, but I haven't seen a direct response. So, is it, so you, you, that's the first question. Is it, is it that important? From each board. Um, and you know, I don't think I've heard the question specifically for the boards individually. Um, and I think, I, I, I think every board would say, of course we think math is important. Um, and it's foundational. I think most would say that. Um, and, but I also think that most boards and communities would want to know what the plan is because if things haven't been working in the past, We'd want to know what the plan is and why you think it's going to work differently in the future, um, especially since we're going to be making this, this in additional investment in it. Um, and the other thing I would like to um, throw out there is that having the boards and staff together in terms of the educational part, um, I think would be helpful. Because instead of having three different silos, meaning the leadership team, the boards, and then the staff, there's, there's more of a, a commingling of those entities and can hear each other's thoughts. I mean, we don't necessarily know what the staff is thinking or the leadership team is thinking other than through you. Uh, and it's the same thing with the other boards. We don't hear that unless we have a but specific discussion at a carousel meeting. But I think what I, what I hear Bill saying, actually, if I'm hearing correctly, is that we know too much about what the staff think. I would not say, no, not, if he's, no. not if he's saying we and the staff are going to propose the plan, because that's a collaboration I heard, that's what I heard, as opposed to a dictation. Um, and that's a very different dynamic. So uh, I, would, I, would, I think we'd be remiss to say we don't want to know what the staff thinks um, about things, because when it comes down to it, implementing the plan is by the staff. So um, my experience is when one or two staff members, I'm going to be really direct, yeah. when one or two staff member complains but the rest are silent, the board listens to the one or two staff members, and you don't know what the whole staff say it. Well then that, that would be the thing we have to work on is to, so everyone could speak, every staff member would feel free to speak and I, I don't, you know, we, we model, hopefully model that for our students and we're not doing that, I mean, I know, you may be yeah. saying Chris, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're in crazy land right now, but I, I it's mm -hmm. just, um, so when you say, let me ask a uh, different kind of question. You're saying that the board and you want to bring the board and the staff along at the same time. What, yeah. is that, what does that mean? That means that as we, as I believe in the governance model in which you have, the board sets the priorities of what we're doing. The board has not done that and has lacked to do that. As a, you know, when I've asked, what are your priorities? What do you want done? The only board that's done that is East Montpelier that said, 
we want kids to improve in literacy and math. Every board has to say that, though? Yes. I believe we did. I remember being there. Yeah, the lot you get, you get, your class has gotten a lot close. Thank you. I, I think the boards it. do need to say that because what I hear, what I hear is when we get into individual meetings, well, what about this content area? What about that content area? And when we have to make tough choices, Chris, we need to know what the prioritizations are from the community. And the board is a representative of the community. Because unless we have a 220 day school year and eight, our school day, I mean, we know we don't have enough time to teach all these all the SLOs. So time might might be uh, I'll say unifying factor. I don't think it's a good term. Um, but from a just give me a sec, I'm trying to bring all this stuff together. From from a board perspective. If, if we say uh, we want math results to improve and there has to be more time in the day allocated to studying math and um, the board expects there's going to be more time in the day spent on studying math, then it falls to the administrators and the staff to clearly understand we want math scores to improve. We want more, and we think spending more time, so it doesn't have to be this, this is an example. We think spending more time studying math in the day is important. Find more time in the day. So then there's only so many hours in the day. Mm -hmm. The plan could be we need a million more dollars and to extend the day or two million dollars to extend the day by an hour mm -hmm. and then we have to manage the community and manage the staff or we need to find more time within the existing time in the day and if the answer is you know I don't know um, you spent it's always an extreme you spend half as much time on art and music as you do now that's the only way you can get the time if math is our priority, we go, okay, we deal with that, we'll support it. And then we have to fight the battle with our communities to say the priority is math. Those other things aren't priority. We have to do less of those so we can do more of math. That's a stance the board can take. That's the stance we took on tier two. We had to fight it for three years at budget every year. We don't want to lose these things. We don't want to lose these things from the staff or we don't want to lose these things from the community. No, we're committed. We're going to improve this type of training. It takes this resources. It takes this schedule to do it. It takes this amount of time to do it. We're committed. We're doing it. And other things were sacrificed. To me, we can't say we want everything. We can say what we want and prioritize it. So I'll, I'll use East Montpelier budget. Last year, our budget, we wanted cuts. We wanted less money than in draft one. And we said, you cannot touch tier two. That was our priorities. That was our directive. So for Bill and Alicia, it was very clear. They had to cut this much out of the budget and they could not touch one penny from this. So bring us a plan. They brought us a plan and it wasn't, we didn't, I don't think we did, we, we didn't, didn't, we didn't micromanage it. This is the lowest priority, that goes, so you can keep this. Okay, thank you, we appreciate the work, that goes. <clears throat> and I think from a board perspective, I think that's part of what administrators are looking for. We're committed to this. If we're committed to math, and how are we going to commit to improving the math scores? I hope the administrators heard from East Montpelier. Yeah, we heard loud and clear. Our extreme satisfaction with literacy, which is brilliant, and we're actually closing the gap for um, free and reduced lunch. They improved more than the non free and reduced. It was like a static. How did like you come to settle on, How did you come to settle on those priorities? Um, we wanted we wanted to make an improvement 
we wanted to move the dial f- between f- um, free and reduced lunch and non-free and reduced lunch. And the plan that was brought to us from the administrative team was to increase tier two, do this type of stuff. It involved restructuring our staff. It involved taking some of our best teachers out of the classroom not the whole day, but part of the day, and it, it involved some changes. Uh, and we said, okay, we'll commit to it for three years, let's see what it showed. And it looks brilliant in literacy, and I'll just speak for myself, I was tremendously disappointed in math. Um, so now it involves tweaking. Some of it, Jen pointed out very adequately, that we have a lot of students that are underperforming in math and literacy. And when they're underperforming in two areas, it really, you know, so we we kind of, I feel like we've solved this the problem around if they're struggling in one area, but we haven't, East Montpelier hasn't solved it on if they're struggling in two areas. So you didn't set a target for number of kids meeting proficiency. You said specifically the issue you wanted to focus on was eliminating the achievement gap. That, or you wanted you to know, is that a fair way to approach? I mean, this I is mean, like say you also said you wanted to improve student performance, and okay. you were willing to say go design it, and you know you can move, you can increase class size, and you know it was it was really around design a system, and it was based highly on embedded coaching professional development at the school level and um, it you know there's the thing that you know we're trying to figure out exactly why some of the math we know some of the why some of the math we didn't give all the time to co- last year and the year before we had to sacrifice math coaching and math interventions to student need individuals some of the individual needs within the building and Carter couldn't put her time in that she was going to try to put in because we had special ed needs and she's a special educator and we had to move those over. We think this year they're back. Chris, that's where I I think, and I I mean, our board does a lot of bad things. It's not like we're a great board. But in this one particular area, I I mean, I think we're pretty laser focused. and, And when we get results, we're waiting to get the results. And we want to see what they are. And we have expectations on what's going to happen. And we continue to support the system. And when staff or community members argue, we listen patiently and we explain why we did that and what our priorities are. And if they want to disagree, then that's okay. But we're, that's what we've asked and we're supporting it. Did you have and community input into the initial decision making? Uh, probably not. No, I don't think you really did. I think you just said as a board, we're gonna take this stance and we're gonna stay with it. And you gave us two years, start showing us results in two years. Mm-hmm. And you really let the administrators design the system with the staff, which is something Marion had been dying and we just continued with. Bill, and you're or Kari, either one, I guess. I'm interested in either one of your takes on this, but are the goals that the School Quality Committee has drafted to present to the SU board, are those advancing or in service to this vision of uh, I think of it's the board, first uh, prioritization that you're describing? It's the first step. It's the first step for the board to say, we're looking at the data because it's the first time that our <clears throat> teacher, all our math teachers have set goals on student performance. We've not done that before in Washington Central. Yeah, you might say it's the first step, or it might say the first step was defining the learning outcomes. Yeah. It's been five years we've been working towards this. What you're describing, I think, is the direction for the SU, but you're just further along, and it's harder for the SU, because we're six different entities, I think. Yeah, we have, I mean, we just have, um, the data piece is much different in different schools, because different schools have Different schools have different levels of experience in using data to inform instruction. 
So for some of our schools, it was, you know, we talked about East Montpelier at school quality and why were they the lowest and they have the most experience in using data and have the lowest scores. And I think it's from that knowledge of knowing their kids because they've been looking at data for a long time. Where some schools, the teachers, this is the first year or the first year in a while, which they've really kind of sat down and had to really think about that data piece. One specific point is, you know, so we asked for, tell us, you know, give us a goal on, for significant improvement in math and, and literacy. And we got that with math and we expected to hear some kind of, you know, resource plan with that. And one of the resources you're asking for is prioritization from the board. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be really clear about that point. Um, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what, the, what it looks like, but at some point we do need a board level statement saying we're going to prioritize math and or literacy above all other things, which is what you ended up doing, right? That was a big part of the success. Well, we may not have said it that way, but we said this is the priority. Some, some version of that. And we haven't done that. but. Yeah. I think that's an appropriate response to us when we say we want to see significant improvement. You say, well, I need dollars, I need time, I need prioritization. Yeah. And see what I, so yeah, I mean, what I, my hope has been really since, since March and the whole idea of setting goals for the, with all the boards and, and, uh, and, and particularly this unique moment in time is that we as boards as we exist now would express what our priorities are uh, educationally. So that you know, if there's change coming in terms of how we're structured and how our communities you know interact with each other, that you know there's a clear expression of what our educational priorities are um, heading into that that process. Um, you know, I I'm I'm actually Stephen, to be honest, not quite comfortable with um, the the lack of specificity in the way you described your priorities, that you wanted to see improvement or you wanted to, I, want, I like targets, I like specific targets. I think it just, you know, um, sharpens thinking and, and sort of, um, you know, makes the planning that much more um, specific, I guess. Um, so I've thrown out an idea, uh, you know, I'd, like, I'd love for at least a first target to be 80% 80, 80 of kids are proficient in literacy and, and math. And, and I, there's also been a thing that has been in or out of that from one time or another. Through tier one instruction is like another another piece of that mm -hmm. that goal that's been thrown out. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's different ways of doing it. We could do we could do that, or we could go. To, I guess this is a question then for the committee: is that we're supposed to be, you know, the school quality committee is, is going to do a presentation, has been preparing a presentation to the SU board for our next meeting, um, and I guess. Mm -hmm. A question for the committee is, you know, do we want to come out of that meeting or put something on the table for the SU board and the boards severally um, to consider in terms of adopting priorities or, or sort of stating, you know, what our priorities are so that the leadership team then has clear, um, you know, a clear statement from us that this is what we want to get behind and defend and we'll demand. Well, I don't know if I said that one so that. we're building the December fifth SU budget uh, agenda. We are. That's it's on our agenda. Yes, um, for tonight. And um, we've talked time at the schools on math to con conceivably improve math results. Um, we control time at the SU board meeting. Um, and I was a chair for a lot of it, so I, I'm as I'll take some of the fault. We've never allocated time, a lot of time, at a full board meeting to have a discussion, let's say, about student learning outcomes around math. And what is, you know, okay, you know, here's a presentation, here's some education. What do we expect? What do we as an SU board expect? Do we want? math and literacy proficiency at 80% through tier one education. That's to me is a pretty, you know, and over, you know, percentage increase over X number of years. That's what the boards expect. Administrators, there's your marching orders, go design something, 
bring it to us and ask us to resource it or ask us to reallocate resources that exist to support that. And then our response can't be, well, no, we don't want to reallocate those resources. It has to be okay in your, in your professional opinion. Those are the lowest priority resources. They need to be shifted from here to there. And we go, thank you very much for your work. Let's shift them. But my point is to spend time in the December 5th meeting, allocate a sufficient amount of time to have this discussion. Well, what I want to say to that is that the December 5th meeting, um, uniquely in recent months, is not a carousel meeting. It is only an SU board meeting. So if we want to structure it to have more time and specifically invest time in having this conversation, we, can, we have that option. We can do that. Well, maybe it's at a few, it's just, I don't think we've allocated a lot of time. We haven't, I mean, I guess. As boards to set priorities. I mean, I have heard, I have to say, like every, every board in one way or another uh, having this conversation, not this specific conversation, they're talking about educational outcomes, and they're talking about how they want educational outcomes to improve, and they're they're talking about math and literacy. Um, so I've heard that at every single board. But it needs to be specific. Maybe the. In I understand that. What, yeah, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, and we. So I hear that we have been. You know, we had the retreat. We've had other conversations. We've we've asked the the, the uh, school quality committee to um, you know come with a recommendation on goals. I guess I'm asking, like, is there enough? And Bill is saying this is the first time he's heard the boards kind of wrestling with data and really sort of interested, invested in this conversation. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm asking if it's too ambitious, I guess, to, uh, or if it's just ambitious enough for us to think we can go into the meeting on the fifth and uh, walk out of that meeting with some decision by the SU board about what its priorities are. You know, I think making a significant decision like this in one board meeting uh, does a disservice to the conversation um, and reflection. Mm -hmm. um, over two meetings, I would say yes, but over one meeting, uh, I, I just I think it does a disservice. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're blending into the school quality mm -hmm. committee topic and, and goal number two, but what the committee, the first part of what the committee is going to recommend for a goal for this year is exactly what Bill and his team proposed in the student monitoring outcome report for math proficiency this year. And just to remind everybody, SU-wide, we started the year at 45% proficiency. They, they are proposing themselves to be at 71% by June. The committee looked at that and said, that's a pretty ambitious goal. That, that feels like a lot of growth in not even a full year, well, one, one school year. We'd be basically half school We'd year. be very happy if we, we achieve that. I also haven't heard any kind of request associated with that specifically. No. Um, so I, I haven't even asked, you know, I've heard the prioritization request. Right, I, I mean, I'm, I'm at the point where I need to have to know need to know the board has our back and this is their pri this is your priority and when pushed by the community and if you say we need to have more conversations with the community I'll wait but I need to know I need to know those from each board and I, I, to, I think we need to know, have a sense of what we might be giving up or might be you, you know. so with the current resources and the current time you will have to give up something in your schedules there isn't there are very few schools there are a couple to have 60, and Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, but to have 60 minutes of math instruction plus interventions outside of math instruction happening every day. So what is the time component that you need for math? Is it 90 minutes? 60 minutes okay. at least is best practice. Okay. Don't say at least, say what you think works. I mean, because when say 60 at least, and a lot of people are meeting that, a lot of schools are meeting that. I'm not saying they, I'm saying they're not, Chris. I know, but you said, it sounds like you said not all are, which indicates some are. Is, yeah, I mean, some, have, some have a 60 minute math block. I, I would say that, I can't quote this for you off the top of my head, but um, few have a 60 minute designated tier one math block plus 
supplemental instruction for students who need it that does not take them away from at least part of important. tier one. Right. Yeah. Okay. And especially, I'll go back again to the even the East Montpelier example. Even when there's a designated intervention block, which is only used for that purpose, if a student needs both math and literacy, it's they, they can't get them both at the same time without sacrificing something. Okay. So, so what's can you do? You, do you have a sense as to what how much time is needed every day for math? I, mean, I think that's what you Sixty minutes. Oh no! Well, it sounded like more from Jen. Well, at least. I mean, I, in part, I told you we're exploring various programs as yeah. resources for math. One of the programs we were exploring said 80 minutes for mathematics, right? Some say, some don't even allocate time in that way. They talk about lessons and they, it's, it's not, um, so I, I think it, it's minimally 60 minutes right now. We've been saying that for years in our math scores aren't moving right now. So do we need to look at even more than that? We need to at least look at that possibility, maybe. But right? we can't even we, say we have 60 minutes of instruction everywhere. Universally, without exception, no. We can't say that that's in place yet. So, so you're asking for that this year? So so this is, this is my experience. One of our principals at Romney was bold enough to go do that. Hmm. And we got a lot of community pushback. But it's still staying. It's still staying. It's still staying. It's still staying. But it was so I from that experience, I want to know where the boards are. Because I didn't ask the question where the boards were before that experience. Because my experience has been the principals and most of the districts are able to, and most of the schools are able to move the schedule around. So I want to, to let me finish. Yeah, we'll, 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 so I want to know the prioritization because you're it is right now it, there is unfortunately somewhat of a there is somewhat of a limit of there's six and a half hours of elementary time there's six and a half hours at U32 right now in middle school is it 75 minutes two or three times a week two or three times a week that's not enough high school same thing um, at our elementary schools at Berlin, lots of intrusions and not every day math is happening. You know, at Cal's it's gotten, we've gotten to 60 minutes, but I can't tell you the interventions are happening. I mean, I can go right through the schools. And so we have to, you know, and it, it's, in some of our places, we said, hey, it's, you know, we want, we have extra, much more time than needed on, and I'm not trying to attack any content area. Um, in our unified art, arts, art, music, PE, guidance, not so much guidance, but those three, in some of our schools, we have way more time than is required. I'm not saying it isn't needed. I'm just trying to tell you what the, and as Jen said, in science and social studies, we're lucky if that's happening a half hour every other day. So if we know if kids aren't grounded in literacy and math, that we're seeing them lose opportunities in middle and high school and elective. And, and we're not even gonna have electives anymore because of the way proficiency is going, but they don't have fewer choices of courses they may wanna take. And so while we let the, for the whole child piece, which I totally agree with, but when I look at it to resource piece and the time we have, if we have limited time and I've gotta look at pre-K through graduation, I'd rather have limited choices or limited opportunities at the elementary school to ensure the basics are done to give more opportunities at the middle and high. I don't feel, and I want to use that word appropriately, I feel that that's where our communities are. And so that's why I'm asking for the board prioritization. And I was just going to say, I don't think the only folks were complaining about 60 minutes of math, it's complaining about what was lost. And so that's really becomes a community conversation is uh, what are you, what, and, and maybe basically hard community choices. These are the things that need to be done, and now you tell us which we're in the packing order of these other things, these other like art and music and, and PD, where they stand. Um, unless we expand the day, uh, you know, because there is a limitation in time. I don't, I don't or we expand the school day. 
That's what I meant. That's, that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Saying. you can span this again. And that's just, yeah. right. we've asked that question, and you know, we were in a negotiation year, but just if you take the simple calculation, I asked Lori to do it the other day. I said, well, you just do a quick back the envelope calculation. It's about a million dollars to get a half hour. So it'd be two million. Um, what was our budget like? Thirty-seven million. Add on our budget, our total budget is about, about 37 million. 37? 27, I thought we were at. Well, I think he's not knitting out some of the Washington Central assessments. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I think, again, like we're. I guess I'm pushing a little bit because. I feel like we're, we're long overdue this conversation and we're coming to it also late in terms of other things that are happening right now um, I guess I'm convinced that stating our priorities ought to be done and it should have been done maybe a while ago um, you know and I feel a little bit embarrassed actually and um, guilty perhaps for our kids that we haven't done it um, I also feel like, politically speaking, um, you know, if there's going to be a consolidation and there's going to be a new board, and that new board is going to be the one that is stating the priorities and you know trying to make some of these changes, um, there's going to be this kind of sense of like, here's this new board coming in and kind of ordering everybody around and sort of trying to do this new way of doing things and. This is exactly what we were afraid of, and you know all this kind of stuff, and and uh, I think that's unfortunate because I think that you know it's been our job, you know, to to uh, put on the table what we think is important and to insist that it happens, um, and we you know we just haven't done it as effectively as we, we could have, and I you know me first of all, um, and so what, that's why I've been pushing this hard, you know, over the last several months. Um, I guess I'm just saying to this committee, to just to say it out loud, it's incredibly important to me that we try to push this as far as we possibly can, as constituted as we are now, um, because I think there's value in it. Um, for us, for the kids, for the transition that it seems like we're about to go through. Um, so, yeah. I would push on the, I don't know, I, mean, I hear what you're saying, Chris, about this is the conversation that I feel like we've been trying to have really for the last several months and we have been moving in the direction of having it um, so I hear what you're saying like you know what doing this in one meeting is not enough and maybe maybe there's appetite to have two meetings or maybe you know I don't, I don't really know but um, I, I guess my own sense of urgency about it is that I would I would push yeah. and we do like all the options that should be on the table including expanding the school day I mean, because there are important things that some kids will not get unless they're getting through school. And I think about art and music, things I, like that. I, I think our job is to say at, at a high level, at a 30,000 foot level, like what do we think is bottom line, non-negotiable, has to happen. And then we ask the administrators and the educators who have the experience and the training and the, the knowledge of the system, what do you, come back to us with a plan. How to do this, um, and that that overlooks the community input because some communities may value certain things, uh, and, and should be represented with our communities. And expanding the school day, I agree, but that's not what we have to do on December fifth. Uh, well, but, but if well, what about expanding the school year? I mean, talk about trying to address the priorities. I mean, I think Bill said that there's not enough time to do the student learning outcomes as it is. And so we're offering a goal that we cannot even support. We shouldn't be offering a goal that we know is unattainable. Um, and not because, because we don't have the time and resources to do it right now. But that's the conversation that we should be having with ourselves and with our communities. That's the conversation. Of, of, so if we're of saying- What like, student learning outcome we're willing to not pursue? I think we're, what we're it's I mean, that's what he's saying. I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Have that conversation. Right. Have that conversation. And I think as a board, you should have that conversation first. Where do you stand as a collective board? No. 
You know, I think you know. I don't. I actually find it hard to believe that our board members don't understand where their communities are standing. I think you know your communities very well. As I watch all our boards, you you know your communities. Well, you say that, but then you talk about the pushback. Um, you know, by some members, fairly by some members, but then that is kind of equating to, you know, teachers not speaking up. Not all community members will speak up. And so do you, are you, the ones who do speak up, you're saying that they're the, they're the representative of the, of the staff? You say no, because you don't hear from the others. And same thing so with it's the, the same thing with the community. I'm, sus I'm suspecting. So, I just, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I do believe in community engagement, uh, engagement, but I also feel like it's a, that we practice representative government. Mm -hmm. And that it's our job to do what we think is right Yep. And it's also our job, if, if we feel that it's necessary, to go out and explain that to people who disagree with us, or if there's pushback, or to and to, to say like, you know, we have had the conversations, and you know, the, the kids are the most important thing. This is the entire reason for our being here is so that our kids will acquire and master certain skills, um, and we're just not gonna. If you if you want somebody a different approach, elect somebody else. Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I honestly feel that way about it. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so We're maybe seven twenty. So, so, <laughs> so to get back to the budget, what I'm hearing is there's no request for additional resources at this time for the budget. I don't, I don't think I'm, I was hearing that. No, before. you didn't hear that. What I said to you is, I won't give you a plan. I can give you numbers and additional money, but I and where we think we can get to, because you know we had three years ago around this table had talked about <coughs> trying to have an additional job coach. I'm not necessarily going to, as you know, we haven't stayed necessarily with job coaches with that money. We've mm -hmm. stayed with professional development. I could tell you right now that the curriculum camp that's funded right now for this year we can pay for with Title IIA federal money. I can't guarantee that's going to be there. That's been your biggest, for lack of better words, research and development work for your staff has been totally funded by federal dollars. It costs about 60000 is about the most expensive of the last three years as I look at total cost. I've told you what an extra half hour will cost, and I would tell you right now if you wanted to add an extra in-service day, it costs about seventy thousand dollars, and an additional coach costs you eighty thousand dollars. This is adding to the the, the schedule beyond what right. is it, one hundred seventy five days. Is that the yeah? yeah. Uh, hundred. We have one hundred ninety days. One hundred ninety days. We have ten in service days. There are some of those that are called for in the contract for certain activities to happen. So, that, so if you're saying if if we wanted to make one hundred ninety five days and we wanted five days of in service, it would be three hundred thousand dollars, roughly speaking. Whatever seventy, yeah, seventy times five is three hundred fifty thousand. Um, but it's that's a negotiation issue, also. Well, we'd have to get into negotiations. I'm yeah, some of the stuff I'm being a little cagey on numbers. Uh, we've got negotiations we're in the middle of, uh, but you know I'm also being pretty transparent that a half hour. You know, when you, you add up all the paraeducators for mm -hmm. an extra half hour, it's about a million dollars. Um, so, you know, it, what we, you know, those are the places, you know, Chris, as you said, you know, having those conversations with the community and with the boards about where are the priorities. You know, if I, it, the thing I want to protect very, I want to ensure to protect, and I think we, you know, if we found out February we were losing our Title IIA money, we would scramble and have to look at and look at fund balance for coming up with sixty thousand dollars for the next year and get it into the budget. I think that's a tenuous place. Okay, the curriculum school. The curriculum we call it curriculum camp. Camp. Okay. At the end of the year, where there's three days for teachers, uh, we have some local money, not much. Most of it's grant money that comes in for that. Um, you know, we had thought about an extra coach. What we have found, and Jen was talking about earlier, we have spread our coaches too thin to really have much impact. So when Stephen says, you know, what's the change? The best coaching happens when the coach is in the building is down the hall. It doesn't happen when it's scheduled up see every six or eight weeks. Um, you know, we hear that from the coaching experts. We just spent a couple days with Jim Knight, who's one of the leading experts in the nation, 
of how coaching works well, what works for coaching. Um, you know, and that's what Eastmont, Eastmont put as success is they were willing to say we're going to take two of our best teachers out, part of them, and it was one FTE total, and put them into coaching, along with intervention. Some of their other work was interventions, um, and give them high, give the coaches high PD, a lot of PD um, mm -hmm. to work. So you know, if I, if I were looking at a money and I were looking at something. I first want to make sure I had the 60000 for curriculum camp. Doesn't mean that it would be used that way. If we still had federal funds, we'd use it for other professional development. My next place would be looking at either an additional day, and some of this we might be able to do in contract negotiations about saying how can we get more freed up in service days. And some of it is increasing, um, you know, or, you know, that extra day is $70,000, you know. Um, I think I, and Jen, tell me, I mean, you, tell me if I'm going on, we've talked a little bit about this today, but you know, I think I would look at those before additional coaching, but we may want to, and that's where we need to have more conversations with our staff. You know, we just haven't gotten to that, I can't give you that specific, because I want to be able to engage our staff and what they think will help them as well, and you've got to have, you know, for people to grow and improve it's there needs to be ownership yeah I mean there's all sorts of research too about you can't um, you can't force coaching right like you can't you can't prescribe right you coaching needs to happen because people want to leverage the coach to improve their professional practice and one of the things we just talked about with Jim Knight at the training the other day is that the sign of a professional is that a professional is committed to continuous improvement right so that, I mean, that's the culture that we are continuing to grow in this learning community. But you can't say, oh, the coach is here, you've got to sign up for a coaching cycle, because it's not going to be impactful. Um, somebody who has an aspect of their practice that they want to improve, and they set a, a meaningful goal with a coach and then decide, it. What's the, what is the data? What are we going to look at? What are we going to try? How are we going to know it's working? Those sorts of things. So that's where we're going to see the difference with coaching. Remind me what is one percent of the SU budget? I'm sorry, I don't. Ninety-three thousand. How much? Roughly ninety, ninety, ninety-three, depending on how you're looking at it. So the numbers you, in my rough count, came out to like two hundred ten thousand. If I added in the eighty for the coach. If you add the eighty. If the eighty for the coach, otherwise one hundred and thirty. Yeah, I mean, one day of in service is on there, but I'm not saying that's the it. That's the 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 answer. I'm just no, trying no, to get right. some relative numbers and right. saying. We would look at that towards professional development in which ways it's going to best impact. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to. This is back to being vague and specific as you know, trying to balance that. Which number? Which number do you have in your mind? I mean, you have the number. Just how I'm going to use it. Uh, I'm in that. that yeah, I think that 130 area. When I was thinking about it, is about an area, but I just don't know how we're going to use it. Okay. And and I. You know, I'm, I'm someone who tends to be like Stephen, and like, I want to plan before I go ask him for money. Right. That's, yeah, that's who I am. He was saying that at the Eastmont right? Pillar Board last night. But, yeah. He was saying that at the Eastmont Pillar Board meeting last night. Yeah. That he, there was a question in their budget about, you know, could, should we just put in extra money for some purpose related to professional development? And he was saying, like, that's not what we do. Like, <laughs> tell us what you want to do, and then we'll allocate the money for it. Just speaking for you, Stephen. So, so okay. back. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a little. It's. I'm. I'm. There's a, it is vague. Yeah. So congratulations, you've succeeded in, in making it vague. Um, I, yeah, I don't know exactly. Sort of. You're saying here are all the, what all the things cost. Do something if you want to. Um, so this but, is this uh, is why I feel this yeah. way. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is the ambivalence of where we are with governance and where we're going to be with an SU budget. Mm -hmm. You asked me last time as well as to look at what's the right size for the SU, for the supervisory union budget, as we look at it now for fund balance and where should we be at. We haven't had time to do that. Lauren and I talked about the time it would take to do it, but in the priorities of everything to get done here, it hasn't hit the list to be done yet of, like, what is the right level? And then, so if you think about that as an SU, as just only a Washington Central budget, but you think about that as a merged supervisor union, what is the right piece? It's not gonna be 
of all the $28 million of budget that we need in fund balance in, in reserve. We know, I know it's going to be less. I don't know how much less it's going to be because we haven't, I mean, I've asked Lori some questions just today of like, so like, what's been some of the biggest years that we've gone beyond our budgets? What's been that amount if we total that up? And then start to look at risk analysis. So there might be money. I just don't know that sitting here today for you. So I can't be a planful uh, CEO for you and say, so, well, maybe, hey, if we use half, the, if we need half the general fund balance than what we currently have in all these separate entities, where, what do we do with that money? Do we put it into capital plans for the buildings? Do we put it into improved um, instructional, improved instructional abilities of our staff? There's many things we can think about that. I just don't have a planned out, you know, sequence for the use of those fiscal reserves. So the question then is, does the executive committee want to propose to the SE board that we increase the budget from the draft we've been given uh, for an unspecified um, for unspecified costs related to professional development? How about anticipated professional development? As opposed to unspecified, I mean, just... Well, I know, it's just yeah. language, but, uh, and, but what's anticipated? Like, that there'll be a, there will be something plan yeah. there'll be a more information is available. Half hour or whatever. Well, half hour would be a lot of money. It'd be a million dollars. Right, increase. excuse me, I should right. have said the answer, whatever. And, well, that, and that would be to the SU budget, it would be across the board. Right, they'd each have to have it would be, it would be across. So I'm going to say this it is a lot easier to plan it when it's in one budget than when you have to pull it through each individual. It's gonna happen with all the teachers, but if you say, hey, sprinkle this out into all the school entities, it just makes it a lot harder for Lori to have to track and us to combine. We do that enough with enough other things we do. Well, that's going to happen. Right. In next year's budget. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, what we're discussing now seems a little abstract. Because hundred thousand dollars and a thirty million dollar budget is what we're talking about. Or, or you know, and I think it should be more actually than that because it sounds like that's the minimum, and you know, it sounds like we want more than the minimum. So that should be two hundred thousand um, at least. You I'll know my it. answer. You saw me last night. I already gave so it, but go ahead. I, my vote's no. <laughs> I'm, I'm not supporting money in the budget that we don't know how we're using, or that is vaguely defined. Not doing it. The place to take that from was where we heard last night. Where? From uh, the surplus. Yeah, fund balance. That's fund like balance. what you were out. I was talking about that. Oh. I didn't know what the fund balance would be needed in a merged system and. There may be places to go from there, or we may come back to you and say, "Look, take it from fund balance." When you have a request, to and our projected fund balance at the in the SU budget is two hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars right now. I have no idea. I don't have the the data, or probably even the ability to, to understand what a fund balance should be on the combined school system, or what it will be once the fund balances are combined. Or you know, right now it's a little over two million, right, Lori? Well, it is, but I started totaling up where everybody's been making restrictions. And yeah. So it's about one point seven million. After everybody's done doing the restrictions that I'm aware of. Yeah. But that's like six per six percent um, of a thirty but, million dollar budget. Yeah. Yes, it is. But see, I go back to what I said structurally way back. So a, a, I'll say no cost. It, it involves a reallocation. So no additional cost um, priority the boards can make is all elementary schools will have 60 minutes of tier one math instruction. If an elementary school is already meeting that, it's being met. Or it could be we want 60 minutes of tier one math instruction in all the elementary schools and we want 30 minutes of tier two available in all the elementary schools. In the middle school and high school, we want now our math instruction every day. I'm making stuff up. Um, 
so we wouldn't be that the boards might not be that specific mm -hmm. but you know we want or maybe we could yeah, do that yeah, well, we but I mean so it's not I don't want to say we'll take more money that's not specified yet but will be specified because we want to improve math I think we say we want math to improve bring it up to minimal standards or in, increase the the, the um, time available for tier one math than what's currently being offered, something like that. And I think that would be, a, and it doesn't require extra money in the SU budget. It, it's just, it's taken a statement to the U32 high school and middle school and the five elementary schools, you will do this. You will do this. You will increase the amount of time spent in tier one math instruction and you will build time in the day to provide some tier two interventions for math if you're not already providing them and then it's up to the individual schools to say all right to do that this is what we're going to give up or to do that this is how we're going to make a change or not make a change so i'm going to just to, we've been here a long time. Yeah, it's 7.35. We're well past it. No, 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 Steve, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to sort of point that. No, 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 I didn't take it that way. I'm <laughs> take, personally, I'm censoring myself. I, I would like to dispense with the budget issue uh, and, and move on to other items on the agenda. So I think, honestly, that the, that the time for us to have expressed our priorities so that they'd be reflected in this budget was probably in June or at the latest, August or September. Uh, we didn't do that, so I, I guess um, you know we're not. There's not a clear ask. I hear, I hear the sort of you know um, the expression of the larger picture is is very useful and motivating. I think, but um, in terms of making a small decision about this budget, doesn't seem um, uh, forcing. I guess so. I propose that we that we not change the budget. But I think I would, I, I would probably couple that with a, a strong sort of uh, desire to go into the SU board meeting, like trying to get something done in terms of prioritization so that in the future, when these conversations come up, you know, it's, I don't know, we're making better and more informed decisions that are aligned with priorities that have been set. To dispense with the budget issue, <laughs> roll that back. I guess I would just, I know I'm the chair. Does anybody else have a different proposal to put on the table? Does anybody else want to propose something different than leaving the budget as it is? Can I just, can I make an observation? Yes. Okay, I'm just gonna, so I've heard a lot of um, words like push, <laughs> mm. defend, demand, they, us. And I just want to make the observation that if we're going to move forward, we all have vital roles to play across the SU in service to our kids. And I just want to put out there that it needs to be we, and it needs to be a shared vision that we can all get, a, get around so that when things get hard, which they inevitably will down the line, we're united and we know that each of us has a, play, a role to play, um, but that we're doing it in service to our students and in collaboration with each other. I just, it, the whole, like the rush, there's a push and a pull that I'm hearing right now that I just wanna reflect back and, and acknowledge also that in the uncertainty of whatever's gonna happen governance-wise, that we can frame it as an opportunity as well to, to come back and have a conversation. So I feel like that was completely um, improv and I, yeah, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but I just wanted to reflect back some of some of the words that I heard the most tonight in this conversation. Thanks. So I would um, move that we increase the budget by one hundred thirty thousand um, dollars because that's what I'm hearing is needed for professional development. Uh, which is opposed to time allocation, which I think is a very different animal. Um, and just 
you know, even without knowing the details. Could you streamline the motion? Yes, I move that we move to increase the budget by $130,000 for professional development. In any area or in math? In, as our administrators seem fit. Is there, is as there our a, administrators seem fit. Is there a second? Motion fails. to recommend, I'm sorry, it's not on the action items. To recommend the budget? Usually, no. usually this committee votes to recommend a budget. So I'll move that we recommend the budget as written to the SU board. Can we do that if it's not on the action agenda? You can always do that. It's your decisions of what you want to do as a board. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion, further discussion? All those in favor of uh, recommending the budget to the SU board as presented, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Nay. Abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Two point two. <laughs> I have to leave in ten minutes. Yeah. I propose we table that Let's one. Let's table this one. Uh, Act forty six. We want to have report outs from the committee. I think every, everyone in their individual boards has had report outs pretty much mm -hmm. from uh, the two committees, what's been going on. I don't think anything has substantially changed. Uh, the articles committee is planning to kick into high gear here and spend a That's true. better part of the day trying to draft something so we can get it polished off and out to legal review and, and individual board review too. Right. Um, tentatively looking at December 7th, having to check with, with Bill about that day. That works, but um, yeah. Um, anything else on Act 46? School Quality Committee? Yeah, so here's what we're prepared to recommend um, that the SU board adopt the set of math learning goals that are in the student monitoring report. There'll be a com uh, committee memo that lays this out. Um, and that we then request comparable goals for literacy. All right, so there would be more work to be done. Bill said that's kind of one of the last things that can be done in a reasonable amount of time. And then complete this year, ask for some reflection by the, by the staff, individually and collectively, about how the goal setting process went and how the actual student learning performance went. And from that, develop um, a set of proposals for multi-year goals, plans, resource allocation for math and literacy, significant improvement in math and literacy. So we we had come into this thinking we would be asking for multi-year. The staff came back with a one-year. We're satisfied with that, but we want we don't want to lose sight of the multi year. So that's that's what we came up with, and we'll be proposing and talking about it. Um, I wonder if we want to allocate some of our uh, December 5th time to a discussion about prioritization and how how strongly do, do our boards feel about math and literacy as top priorities. I'm not sure exactly how to frame it. We could probably spend some time offline, but do do we want to allocate time on a, that night to having that discussion? Because it seems like if we're moving towards a multi-year plan for significant improvement, we're going to have to answer that question. Okay. Any questions about the uh, school quality subcommittee? It's going to come up again under the SU agenda, but. Um, Mm -hmm. I would just like to thank that committee for the what I think has continue, been continued very high quality work. Thank you. So yeah, let's try to uh, see if we can get 
the SEO agenda. There is a budget presentation, obviously, and the recommendation of the executive committee. Um, I believe when we created the two I-46 subcommittees, we required that they report out at the December 5th meeting, uh, essentially the progress of their work. Um, so that will have to be on the agenda as well. Um, the school quality committee, we've asked to come with this report that Kari and, and uh, colleagues are preparing. Um, I'm not sure, Bill, if there are other things that uh, have to be on our agenda for December 5th, but I'm not. But we're going to know a lot more in a couple of weeks. Yes, that's right. Because yep. there are traditional things that do happen there, but they may not. Okay. All right, so we'll just put a question mark around. Well, usually we're approving a budget, and I have to go look at the old agenda from, I always go back and look at the year before about the required motions that have to be done by the SU board, and they may or may not have to be done. I, Chris, I don't remember those right off okay. the top of my head. Richard, um, and I would suggest that anything that we think needs to be required to be done at that meeting um, should be done in the off chance that a injunction is issued, just because it's, you know, it's a time factor, and it's, it's the consideration that we're not caught short, short, short. You know, based contingencies certainly, but I think we just would have to have other meetings. What? I think we would have to have other meetings. Other meetings. Okay. And then, uh, what's the executive committee's preference with regard to putting something else on the agenda about? This larger conversation, or do we think the school quality committee's report would lead into that, or? I think we should be specific about it. Okay. And just have a specific agenda, and some people forewarned rather than just yeah. assuming it will be part of the um, school quality committee presentation. Do we want to say well, what do we want? Educational priorities. Uh, let's see. Full board discussion on on educational priorities and trade-offs because just putting it out as priorities without taking into account the trade-offs is being much. very yeah it doesn't mean much but could we still build it off this I'm just so notice build priorities off what is presented I would just hate to have we're gonna we're gonna present some information and some recommendations to, to me it would be efficient and constructive to now take what we've heard and how do we want to prioritize that or do we want to prioritize that mm -hmm. so that it, instead of everyone coming in and we've got 30 different ideas on what we want to talk about prioritizing we want to talk about this information do we want to prioritize it and if we do how are we going to prioritize it well put this information in the context of, of the whole you know it's not a standalone we're not prioritizing among among this narrow um, group of information we're talking about in terms of the entire school day right so let me Italy. Yeah, I, and I don't know exactly how to do this. I didn't hear Bill and Jen's presentation Can before I tonight. Ask, so, has anyone got a pickup out there with lights on? Uh, looks like someone has a pickup truck with lights that are dying. Yeah. No oh boy. Someone got a pickup truck? No. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Okay. Just because I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been out there. No, it's... it might be my husband waiting for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's asleep. Sorry, I just saw it. It got dimmer and dimmer. And I yeah, like, I told him to come at 7. No, it's okay. Um, at least we know it's only breaking oh. in or doing something. So, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I think there's value in kind of what Jen and Bill presented in terms of framing the conversation. I don't know how it how it syncs up with what Kari, the school coordinating committee, has been doing. You know, I don't know how to... Yeah, so my thought about having the prioritization discussion is not so much about this year, but about before we get to this multi-year plan proposal, let's not, let's not have 
have the staff come back and say, well, what is the priority? We, let's, let's start to get clear now. It might take more than one discussion. Um, certainly by the time the next round of budgeting happens, we want to we want to have some clarity on prioritization. As we've been told that that's really I important. like that. Yeah. So it's basically, the school quality committee is coming, and one of its recommendations is we we want to ask the the leadership team, right, for what a three five year plan looks like. Yeah. But in order to do that, we're hearing back from the leadership team that we need the boards to say what our priorities are. Something like that. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. To structure uh, mm -hmm. that. I can flesh out the memo a little bit to frame that. Okay. Is that? So, do we need that discussion at all for actions for this year between December and June? Uh, say more about that, Chris. I'm not quite following you. Well, there's going to be um, there's a um, for tonight is a goal to improve um, if it, a proficiency from forty five percent to thirty seventy one percent. That's like a quarter twenty six. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a, yeah, bit, yeah. quite a bit. So, so is there a um, need for clarity in terms of movement of the schedule of teachers within to achieve that goal, or are the uh, the um, schedules and assignments that are in place now expected to achieve that? That's a really good question. Um, well, you think about it. Can I? Yes, please go ahead. I don't think that requires any board action. Tell me if I'm wrong, but that's what the teachers said they would do. Yeah, they, they didn't start. ask for anything. Their expectation is they set those goals based on what their expectations are. They're going to be able to get to seventy-one percent. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't require any administrative action in terms of allocation of resources, or time, or anything like so that. So I would. I, right, I'm going to go the same place where Stephen is. Yeah. The important, the reason why this goal is so powerful. And for some of our teachers, it's the first time of really declaring this is where I think my students will be. I think for some, then they'll obtain it, and some they won't. But that's the learning. That's the action research part, and the learning from using data to inform their instruction. So I think that's, I think changing inputs at this point, after we've already asked them to make those goals, we're going to learn from it. We may or may not achieve it. I don't think that that's what the most important thing of it. it. The most important thing is how are we using data and how are we using that to judge where our students are at and what actions did we take. So I think leaving it right now where it is is probably the best thing because we're going to get a lot of learning out of this. This is our first time doing this. Mm -hmm. So trying to change up the variables and the inputs already two months past it, or a month and a half past that decision point, I think we keep going with what we're going with right now. I don't know if you have any different thoughts. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we really asked folks to set what they thought were realistic goals and um, based on what, what the current status is. So I, I think they were prepared to do that. I think they were very thoughtful in their approach. They were looking at both achievement and growth and um, doing something like this for m many folks the first time, you know, good faith effort, good mm -hmm. attempt, and let's see where we come. And I mean, I think Bill's exactly right. It's a learning experience for everybody. We, we might be right on track. We might not hit it. We might exceed our goal. And we can analyze what happened, reflect, and, and do better next time around. And that's where we'll get a lot more, a better, a clearer plan of what do we need to move forward because we'll be collecting the, the, the school quality committee asking for that reflection ensuring that reflection happens on an individual basis well, really that becomes a, that becomes a step in bringing the staff along right. yeah. to, so yeah. math was a priority we asked for your input this is what you thought was realistic it, it was realistic and you did that so understanding that if we want to move the needle a little bit more, mm -hmm. is it realistic to think you can improve by five more percent and we can just just say we want you to do it or do you need resources to do that? And then over multiple years, what would that look like to support and resource? But as a board member, when I saw staff say they think this is realistic, I was ecstatic. If we can hit that, 
Mm-hmm. I think we'd all be thrilled we'll be to thrilled. see that happen. Yeah. 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 And it's sure. like a lot easier from, from my perspective. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make yeah. it easier for the staff. They would be working their butts off. But, so yeah, I, I haven't heard any requests for resources. They think they can do it. So let's give them the time and the space to do it. And in the spring, either have a celebration or a commiseration. And if it's a celebration, let's keep going. If it's less than that, okay, we have faith in you. What do you need to hit that goal the next time? Okay. So I think we have a pretty full agenda, actually, for the SU meeting. Um, and, and I'm assuming there are no other sort of burning suggestions for what needs to come up then. Um, the, I guess I would also ask if it's the sense of the executive committee that there can be a little flexibility in terms of Bill and myself planning for the timing of that mm-hmm. meeting. Just I want to make sure that we sort of do some real thinking about how to do that, hopefully, more, we more efficiently than we did tonight. But, um, Will we need to spend the time? I think so. I don't know what we would normally normally budget for that meeting, if it would be too high. I'll, we'll just look at it, I guess, okay. and try to. I have complete sure that confidence that you and Bill can develop an appropriate mm-hmm. agenda. We'll try to live up to your uh, <laughs> <laughs> your kind expectations there. Yeah, we're here's a bit uh, shares. For the action item, I'm not sure where the... I have a motion. Yeah. I'll make a motion okay. to approve board orders in the amount of $890,474.16 XX. Yeah. I'll second. Can I ask a question before we vote? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So aquatic rehabilitation. Students have it. A student has it written into their IEP. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for more pointers. Okay. Any other questions or discussion about the board orders? All those in favor of approving the board orders, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, accepting the retirement of a special ed teacher yeah. on page 15. I would make a motion to accept the retirement of Susan Dennis, Susan Dennis as a special education teacher. Is there a second? second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Carries. Uh, the superintendent's report is on page 16. So I thought I'd give you a highlights of just some great things that have been going on this fall. Um, if you don't follow me on Twitter or Facebook, there's a lot more on there than what we've collectively pulled out of here. So try to put something up every couple couple things every week. What went up today was uh, celebrating. We had a great story on CAX about it. They turned it kind of into a bullying story about how we're supporting bullying and improving that. But it was really started out as I a trauma. I well, the, I saw it at 11 o'clock. I don't know if that was a full one. Or that not. wasn't the full one. Because it, so, uh, I didn't come away with bullying yeah and the and one that, away with being just supportive of, of kids getting kids yeah. to talk and we're it started as yeah, in yeah. supporting kids um, with their trauma transform work that we've been doing and they you know as they all do all the media kind of used it for what they were where they wanted to go and uh, they talked about the it really did a nice job of both at our elementary school and at U32 the work we're doing with kids to work together to solve issues. Um, so I, I just watched the long version right before mm-hmm. at three o'clock today. So uh, it's on the WCAX website. And was it reported it tonight? It was reported last night on the six o'clock. News. But I think you can probably you can no, get it right off the website. Yeah, it's right on the website. Sarah. The second thing I'd let you know and I uh, did let uh, Matthew know this um, Sally Hall our HR coordinator had tendered her resignation. She was moving on to other opportunities. Uh, her last day of work was last Friday, so we're hiring right now for an HR coordinator. And if we had more time, I would discuss this more with you. Um, but uh, 
the whole central office we've been talking about, the work we're doing, the roles and responsibilities, some of that was aligned with the work on salary uh, levels and the non-bargaining levels and starting to look at that. And uh, Lori and I have been talking and we really need to look at our, to get ready for looking at how we're compensating people, we need to look, especially within central office, we need to look at workloads and our business operations. So we're starting to look at that as well. I may come back to you asking to expand the salary piece so that we have our business operations, especially our HR working. We have different folks who do different parts of HR that really weren't, aren't under the HR coordinator. For example, our payroll person does a lot of benefits support to personnel. Uh, so Laura was the one who brought it to me. She said, you know, we should really look at our operations here and what we're doing before we do a salary analysis. Um, as I told you last month, or last meeting, November 6th, we haven't been able to get to that work. Um, we're really trying to say, are we doing things right? And some of that's not only come from the HR piece and the, not the salary, but also from um, the software, transferring to a new fiscal software. Lori said, hey, we're going to make the switch to software. We should really the software mirrors our operations. We should ensure we're doing this right. So we're just starting to take some looks at that as well. Then I'll bring you more information next time we meet on that. So I'm being brief because we're at eight o'clock. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Bill? Mm -hmm. The director's report on page nineteen. I just want to say I really like it, <laughs> and I hope the David Melnick class goes every year. It's, it's great that there's that much demand, and uh, I really like the Zenith program. That sounds awesome. Yeah, so, um, actually, I'd love to hear more about that at some point, but that's not an official request, so <laughs> I'd be careful to say that. <laughs> so, uh, the financial report is on page 20. Mm -hmm. Nothing changed. We just met two weeks ago. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. There's a two yeah. o'clock to tell us. Right. Yeah, we're good. Well, well, she you need to be here for the budget oh. conversation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Both Jen and <laughs> Laura need to be here. Shortest report ever, okay. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the interest of time. The policy <laughs> committee was postponed. The school quality committee have <coughs> heard negotiations. Um, we're, we're going to be starting negotiations in Monday. Monday, Monday. the twenty sixth. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Probably enough. Okay. Uh, future items: special education hiring process. I'm not sure we're ever going to get to that. Honestly, that's fine. Um, are there any other future items? Okay, members. Well, would it be worthwhile to keep prioritization on there? Yes. Yes. Sure. I mean, it, I mean, you understand by saying that one word, would it? I do. Yeah. 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 Education. Like, uh, yeah, educational therapy or something like that. Yeah. So just before we uh, quickly before we adjourn, since we're quite late, um, I just want to say, uh, Bill and Jen, how much I appreciate the, the the response of the leadership team to that question. I think it kind of went in a direction none of us were really expecting, but I really appreciate the the, uh, the thinking behind it and the conversation that it sparked. And I think that um, you know, it's uh, the sentiment I'm gathering from this evening is that our, it's our intent to respond, um, you know, in kind, I guess. So uh, if you just express appreciation, I guess, and the, the yeah, leadership team sure. on our behalf, I appreciate that. Thanks. So with that, we are adjourned at 8.05 with apologies and thanks for everyone's patience.